I'm used to this surround sound at home. My wife keeps saying, turn it down, turn it down. <laughs> it's so good to be with you, not only to be able to share the, the wonderful good news of the, the scriptures and shows to each one of us, but it's good to be in a church family that you can call your own. And uh, it was fun to be able to be with you as an intern several years ago. It's been fun to be a visitor, but it's also fun to be a men- member. And so it's, it's a joy to be with you and share God's word with you today. As I've sat through the pew in, in pews in many churches, Uh, in my travels, in my responsibilities, I've come to the conclusion that there are a few things that um, we're not hearing enough of. (laughs) We're just not hearing enough of. That is not to say that any pastor isn't doing a great job because I think God is working through all of our pastors. They're doing a great job. Thankful for the pastor you have now. And, um, but I think that somehow there are some things that I need to be able to hear in my heart a little bit more. One of them is that I'm not, I'm not hearing and understanding and responding well enough to the reality of our times as they fit into scripture and knowing that Jesus Christ is coming again. I really believe his coming is soon. If we see the fruition of our political experience in this country come to a a culmination in something that uh, I am dreading, I think that perhaps his coming may be very soon. Um, If you have great hope in all that are happening politically, then... um, then perhaps God will be able to work with them well and we'll have a little more time to share the realities of his coming before he returns. I'm hearing, um, I'm wanting to share with you something that I'm hearing in my heart that I feel that each one of us needs to know every day a little bit more. And I would like to ask you, if you would, just to join me in inviting the Holy Spirit to be able to hear that Holy Spirit speak to you this morning. So please bow your heads and let's invite him to come. Our dear Lord and Heavenly Father, you've promised us the Holy Spirit to speak in behalf of yourself, to influence what is being said this morning, and I would pray that you would give that gift of the Holy Spirit to me this morning so that the words that are shared today wouldn't be my own, they would be your words, and we'd be able to hear from you and to respond to you. And so I thank you for the gift, and I look forward to what you will say. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'd like to direct you to the book of Isaiah. This book is not, um, is not something that is being spoken in the way that we usually think it is. Isaiah chapter 43 was written by Isaiah in the midst, midst of conflict, fighting, war, and things like that. That's not anything new to us, is it? (laughs) We can see it happening all around us. Um, It's written in a way that I believe can be interpreted in many places to be said in a very intimate way. We tend to feel that God is speaking to us as a total group of people those who believe in him, large groups, thousands of people, and it's kind of spoken in a typical way that a sermon might be even spoken. 
But in this chapter, I think you can find a tremendous blessing if you read these words in a way that God would be speaking to you on a personal basis in a very intimate way. When I was young, I grew up a Seventh-day Adventist. I may have shared that with you before. Grew up in this Pomona church. I know I shared that with you before. It grieves me somewhat to see that it's now up for sale. But as I realize that demographics have great effects and the ministry is carried out not by the church building but those who fill it, I understand why it needs to be sold. I heard a whole lot about the second coming of Jesus when I grew up. The words that resonate most often to me in my ears when I think of my child was words of a finished work. (laughs) Words that talked about let's do it for God kind of stuff. And I feel blessed that I grew up in that particular time. But somehow with the the speeches that I got, the sermons I got, the sharing that I got, and I feel that it was timely for that time, very timely, and still timely for today. Somehow, personally, in my own development, I heard something that went something like this. God wants to come back badly soon, and that's good. God's hoping you'll be there. That's good. God wants you to be part of the finished work and work hard to finish it. That's good, too. God wants you to be good. That's good. But somehow in the manual of all those good things I interpreted on my own that I wasn't good enough. And that God was hoping I would be there, but I probably wouldn't make it. I felt I just wasn't good enough. And the value of me was low. (laughs) And the value that it took to be in the heavenly kingdom was high. Loved one, if you've ever experienced that, if you've ever said to God, I'm not good enough for you, then you need to turn to Isaiah chapter 43. It shows a totally different kind of God. I'm not going to read the whole chapter to you, but I'm going to skip a little bit. And I'm going to challenge you with when you go home today, pick up your Bibles, read all of chapter 43. That will connect the dots that I may not be able to do today. And also our verses chapter 15, it seems, are tied very much in the New Testament to this in the Old Testament. So look at that too. But in the very first... Um, verse in chapter 3 I find these words but thus says the Lord your creator that's the beginning of the intimacy he doesn't just say I'm the creator he's saying I'm the one that made you (laughs) I'm the one that made you ladies you can identify, those of you that have children, you can identify with God saying, I'm the one that made you, and turn that into understanding clearly that it's filled with love and passion and compassion and expectations. I'm the one that made you. And I'm the one that formed you. And he refers to all of Israel in this particular thing. But I think he's talking to each and every one of us here. He says, do not fear. How many parents 
really want to be able to train their children right, but they don't want them to be afraid of them. They want them to know that you love them deeply and you cherish them and what you're asking to them t- to do is for their own well-being, their best interest in life. And part of learning how to be the best that you can. So don't fear me. Don't be afraid of me. Especially because I'm the one that redeemed you. Now the idea of redeemed, I found as I looked around, really came from a a New Testament set of laws. And the idea was When you've done wrong, I have bought you back. I have bought you back. I paid to get you back. A little bit early in my childhood, it had to do with green green stamps and blue chip stamps. And you saved them and saved them and saved them. You went and got what you really wanted. You redeemed them with those. Um, I don't know which actually fits better in understanding God but he paid to get us back he bought us back he saved for a long time a lot of effort a lot of saving went into that kind of experience he's received he's redeemed you and then it says I have called you by name and you are mine Can you imagine that? Anything that's more intimate than that? I've given you my name. If any of you have been adopted, you would understand clearly what it took for someone to say, I want you so badly and I want to give you my name. I have chosen you. I have chosen you. I want you so badly. You are mine. And that's what God's saying to each one of us today. And when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you, uh, when you go through rivers, I will be with you. They won't overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will a flame burn you. I am there to protect you. For I am the Lord your God. In chapter 43, you see three major themes going on here. One is the intimacy of God's relationship to us. The second is this whole idea about the name and, um, and the fact that you are God's child. You are the God's child. God is the God above all gods. No matter what's out there, what's taking your time, what is there in your life, I am number one. I am the God over all things that call your attention. Or other gods that say, I am God too. God is saying, I'm your God, but I am also the God, the God of all gods. I've given Egypt into your ransom. I've Cush and Seba in your place. And then in chapter 4, something I revel at. Since you are precious in my sight. Precious. Can you imagine... Anything more intimate than calling you precious? I, uh, I thought to myself, there might even be some young lady whose name is precious here. <laughs> I've met a precious. I've got friends that are sunshine, and I've got friends that are April and May and June, and there's some preciouses out here. <laughs> but I can tell you this for sure today. In this environment and beyond into our great city and all over the world, all God's creations are precious to him. 
In my teen years, I didn't feel very precious to anybody. (laughs) And I looked around and I got some real rude openings in my life. My eyes began to open up. I not only didn't feel I was good enough to God, I began to feel that I wasn't precious to him either. But there was a night when I felt like giving up that I stayed in that darkness with God and finally said to him, Lord, I just feel like I can never be good enough for you no matter how hard I try. And I feel like I... I'm going to give up and walk down this path, but if I keep going, I know there won't be no chance for me whatsoever. Finally, I reached out and I said to him, Lord, God, whatever I've called you in the past, Jesus, there's no way I'm going to be in heaven on my own. There's no way I can make it without you. I can't change enough. I can't be good enough. The only way I would be able to make it is if you would take me the way I am and somehow change me. And I may have shared with you before at that moment, God said in a very real voice right beside me what he said several other times in my life, what took you so long? (laughs) You're exactly what I want exactly how I want you and I can work with you from here on you're mine what value do we have loved ones I can share with you equivalently that if I'm walking in this life without Jesus Christ I don't have any value I have value to God because he still wants to redeem me. But on my own, if I walk without him and I choose to be without him, I have very little value. If you feel like you're one of those people that is struggling with value on yourself and what am I here for and where do I fit in and does anyone love me and etc., etc., God has all the answers. He's already called you precious. He loves you so deeply. He's already redeemed you and paid the price. You have ultimate value. You have ultimate value. I had an experience this last week. I don't look forward to these. In trust services and planned giving, we get to be friends with people who are already planning for their demise. (laughs) They're already planning for the time when they rest. And and I know when I make a friend, I may outlive them, especially the older ones that come to me. One lady, I went to visit her in the Midwest. She wasn't even an Adventist. She wasn't a Seventh-day Adventist, but because of the witness of her friends, she said, I know it's a good church, it's good people, they'll do something good with my money when I'm gone. (laughs) Don't ever doubt your witness doesn't make a difference. It does. Always God can make it make a difference. Through the last six or seven years, I've had great times being with her and talking with her and everything. This last week, I stood by her bed. She told me the doctors gave me bad news. I said, well, what of that? And she said, "Um, I will never walk again. I don't like that. (laughs) And I said to her, well, that doesn't mean the end of things. You know, there's plenty of contributions you can make life and life and do. And she said, yeah, but I don't, I don't want to go on under that condition. So I tried to encourage her and through the days. And the last time I met with her, she asked me something. And I, got, I think God put it in her mind. She, he, she said, um, what are you preaching about this week? <laughs> I said, thank you, Jesus. I said, I'm, I'm preaching on Isaiah chapter 43. And in there, there's a verse that I think you'd find interesting. 
She said, what's that? And I said, you are precious in God's sight. I said, as you lay in your bed, you're not alone. You're not just one of many other people that are going through this experience around you. You're not just heading off somewhere by yourself. Some great unknown. You are precious to God. Her face lit up. She said, I'm precious. <laughs> precious to the Lord. That's the intimacy of the joy that I think God is trying to communicate with us today. Don't fear. I am with you. Those who have found their love of Jesus in his love for you, don't live in fear anymore. We can handle what goes around us because we know God's in control and better than that, God's in control of our lives. We are precious to him. And then, in closing, I want to share something here. Down around the 10th verse, just last part of the 9th, it says, oh, let them hear and say, it is true, you're not just precious. You are my witness, declares the Lord. And my servant whom I have chosen, in order that you may know and believe in me and understand that I am he, before me there was no God formed and there will be none after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and there is no Savior besides me. It is I who have declared and saved and proclaimed, and there is no strange God among you. So you are my witness, declares the Lord, and I am God. God had a purpose and an idea in creating you. You were created out of love, because he just had to express more love in those universes. You were created out of love. You were created precious with ultimate value to him. And you were created for the purpose of sharing that with everybody you get an opportunity to. In every way that God has created in you to be able to accomplish that. You don't have to go out of your box to witness for Jesus Christ. He created your box for you. He will place the people around you. He will give you the opportunities. All you have to do is beam and live in joy because you know you are precious to God. Isn't that marvelous? Isn't that amazing? God is amazing. God is marvelous. God is miraculous. In reality, he's even more than wonderful. Amen. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, you are so wonderful. We take all of our self-worth because we belong to you. We've received your name. And now we long as we leave to be led by you into the joys of sharing you with others. Give us this experience. Give us the opportunities. Give us your words. In Jesus' name, amen.